I'm going to tell you a story. And I've, I've shared this story all over North America. It's a personal story. Uh, we might have some tears to it, might have some, some laughs as well. I hope ultimately, uh, you know, I, you leave this room thinking, thinking about what you heard today and, and relating the story you're going to hear to your own lives and your own choices and that of those around you that you care about. I've called the story our story. Uh, maybe I'm not the best with titles, but uh, you just kind of stuck. I got a bit of sarcasm in there, I'll throw in there too, so you can either laugh at the sarcasm or just laugh at how awkward it is for me to tell the joke and no one laugh. It's your call. <laughs> I'm good either way. But uh, before I tell you the full story, I'd like to go back to a little side one. And, you know, I, growing up, I was uh, definitely one of the wilder ones of my friends. We were, we were the crazy partiers of the high school. Uh, being a Canadian, kind of cliche, but I grew up playing hockey pretty much from the time I could stand. I was really into sports. As I got a bit older, it was my teen years, you know, when I started signing up with drugs and alcohol, and I started making some pretty poor choices in life. And I became a bit of a liability for the select hockey team I was playing for. And that kind of ended my hockey career. But at that point, I also started to skateboard so bored. When I wasn't on the board, uh, my friends and I oftentimes were out partying. You know, we all started to get vehicles and, and that party carried on into the vehicles. There's a lot of nights where we made some pretty stupid choices. And I come back on those nights and you know there was there were signs, there was warnings and uh, maybe I wasn't ready to see them but one I look back on always and I'll tell the little story here before I get the full story was it was a camping trip. And, you know, we're all out there and, as usual, one party harder than others. I barely slept, partied all day, and I wanted to go grab some more beer. And you know, some of my friends weren't thinking this is too good of a choice, but I was pretty sneaky, so I snuck off and no one was looking. And I was about to pull away, and one of my best buddies come running up. He just said, Kevin, you know, you're, you're not trying. You're drunk, you, you can crash, you can hurt yourself, hurt someone else. Shrugged it off. Ah, beer store's around the corner, I'm going, it's all good. My friend, he, he, he knew it wasn't all good. And I'll never forget the words he said to me next. He said, Kev, look at your legs. I imagine you couldn't use those again. Look at your skateboard. I imagine you couldn't ride it again. I imagine you couldn't ride this tomorrow. And those words hit me. And I pulled the keys to ignition. I gave my friend. I gave him one of those half handshake hugs. Don't know what it's called, but you might know what I'm talking about. Thanks. Thanks, man. Yeah, I went back. And I started with that side story because really that's, that's a friend, you know. And he was making that better choice. He had my back that night. He could have saved my life. Who knows who else's life I had to take the wheel and drove. That's what friends do. I hope people in this room just do the same, you know, look out for each other. And we're all here in this room right now for a reason, and that is because, you know, we care about each other. We never want anything bad to happen to each other. Whether it be your friends, your family, your community, it's really important to look out for each other. And still years later, although I might have been a bit of a jerk that night to that friend, Years later, when I see him, I still thank him to this day for being a good buddy, for watching out for me. But it's, it's unfortunate I didn't learn my lesson that night, because about a month later, it was a big weekend. On Friday night, my younger sister, or I, actually, two sisters, Allison and Haley. On Friday night, it was Allison's graduation, so some parts going on with that. And Saturday was a big night, too. My, my younger sister, Haley, she was five years old. It was her first ever year of ballet and dance. My friends have ever been to one of these ballet or dance recitals. I gotta say, the first years of five-year-olds, it's always the best part. Because they come out, the lights turn on, and they forget everything they've learned in the past year. And it's pretty much complete chaos on the stage. Kids are tripping all over one another. Two are to shove the match. One starts crying, makes a run for it, bails, totally slams, takes up half the stage. It's so awesome. We're laughing. When Andy was selling flowers in the theater, so we got some flowers and we took them down to my little sister Haley. I remember resting around with her, throwing them in the air, catching her, tooling around that night like a big brother does with his little sister. You know, looking back, it just gets me that I never, I never once saw that maybe this is the last time I knew that my little sister. I never once saw maybe something go down that night that could change my life. The lies end around me forever. I just didn't see it coming. And that's my wife a couple hours later, I'm out in that car. I'm partying, I'm going for party, party, friends are with me. We're leaving the last one of the night. We've all been drinking. Some of those hockey buddies I was hanging out with knew there's no way they should be getting in the car with me. They call a taxi, they don't say. 
shifted a few bottles, got it safe ride home. And there's a lot of things I look back, could have done different that night, besides not being no party hard. Could have called for a ride, I could have walked home, could have slept at the party. But I didn't even have to call for a ride. You know, both my parents, they knew what I was up to. They're calling me off the hook, Cat, you need a ride, just call some people that left home. They kept calling, it started to annoy me, I stopped answering. I wish I had them, because that ride was there. And I don't encourage anyone to go out and drink or party, do any of that stuff, but in any situation, you find yourself where you don't feel safe out in that vehicle, or you just have a bad feeling something's going on. Well, those feelings are there for a reason. And if you have someone you can call that will get you home safe, please take them up on it. You know, I wish I had it. I decided to hop in the car. I was going to drive. And my friend Brad, an old hockey buddy, knows since really young. He hopped in with me. We grew up together playing hockey. He even dated my sister Allison for a couple of years in high school. I knew Brendan well. I don't remember driving away from the party. Just vaguely driving past old high school, cut on the sill, and stopped at a red light. It's a T intersection. So I'm turning right, turn a left, right? So let's party some more. On that night, I look back, it's really all that it was, but I see there's so much more now. It's, it's one of those crossroads in life. Whichever way I turn, whichever choice I make, it's going to determine everything. My life, Brendan's life, and around us. Their lives too. But all the same that night is another party. It's more fun than going home. The figure I was going up was about 85, 90 miles an hour. About 45 zone, <laughs> way too fast when I was sober, not alone a pair. Tried taking the corner, I went around many fat times faster than my car before. I never made a corner. The car struck a little pedestrian island, flew in the air over the island, hit the ground. I don't remember how many times it rolled. I don't remember stopping it upside down. I don't remember dangling there climbing for life. It'd be weeks later that I would start to find out details. Find out that there was that only that seatbelt that I was wearing that saved my life that night. A collapsed along my own with it, other injuries. You know, had it landed any other way than upside down, blood and fluid would have pulled into my lungs. I would have drowned. I would have dead. I would have worn the seatbelt would have been shot out of the car. The killing impact hit the ground and not the car rolling on top of me. The seatbelt saved my life. I would slowly learn other details. But at first it was my family. Who heard the story? Who got that phone call? That phone call no one ever wants to get. If someone they care for or love. And sadly, I don't think I've been to a presentation, to a school, or anywhere yet. Or I haven't met a person. A few people or more have had such a call. Or worse yet, had that knock on the door. That's the worst one. Because that means you didn't live. You know, if that's you in this room, all I can say is I'm sorry because you know what I'm talking about right now. My family, Brendan's family, I woke up. I thought I woke up one of them in this horrible crash. It was bad. It was a hospital. It was the last time they see me alive. They were in shock, to say the least. When they got to the hospital and prepared for what they're going to see, I didn't look like their son, their brother. My body had swelled to double the size from the trauma. It was one big bruise. I was cut up all over and losing a lot of blood. I would later need two blood transfusions. Dislocated shoulder, separated shoulder. Lost a collarbone on each side, fractured vertebrae in my neck, collapsed lung, mild head injury. I did not look like myself. He told my family at very best 20, maybe 30% chance I'd live. So the odds, they were against me. And I can't say I remember those crucial days or times. I knew eventually I was stabilized, moved to a new hospital. I continued to fight for my life though. And that fight began as well. Because of the pain, the injuries, they put me on a lot of medication. And I was reacting to that medication. I was seeing things. I was hallucinating. And all these hallucinations, they were, they were nightmares. There was people after me. People were trying to get me. I mean, I actually remember seeing this as real as being here right now today, seeing doctors and nurses at the end of my bed saying, when his parents sleep tonight, we'll pull him off the breather, and he's going to die. Obviously, that wasn't going down. You don't know the worst, sketchiest hospitals ever in Canada. They're pretty good, right? This was all in my head. I'm sure it was real. There was a lot of tubes as well, and one in particular was in the throat, pumping air into my lungs, keeping me alive. But where it sat, it blocked off my vocal cords. So I couldn't even yell or scream for help if I wanted to, or try to explain what was going on in my mind to my family. He could only read my lips and try to get it. 
There's two camera side for claps long. Apparently the ones I like to pull up the most. There's two in each nostril, one pumping nutrients in, one pumping his stomach infection out. And the worst tube of all was about pinky size. You could possibly guess where the worst tube of all went. It's not your arm, right? Down here, probably like a foot long. Now I could probably really easily insert an inappropriate foot long joke right here, right now in my first presentation ever in Texas. I do that. I kind of just did. Uh, <laughs> guy or girl, you get a Catholic. I, I don't think I need to explain to anyone in this room. Oh, you don't want that? Down there, right? You yeah, haven't seen it on Jackass or Nitro Service, you know, Catholic. It's pretty harsh. This is my summer. At some point, I started taking out the medication. Maybe that's why I was acting so aggressive. This is where I started to some memories. Um, you know, up to that point, it was just hallucinations. But now I'm awake a bit, and it's this constant panic struggle feeling. The nurses, they race in the room every morning, needles, take blood, put me in this machine, out machine, CAT scan, MRI, tubes in, tubes out, complications, stomach infection, blood infection, staph infection, lung infection. It just never seemed to end. And through it all, it's my family on my side. And you know, here's a family that Made a lot of poor choices growing up. I put through a lot of, a lot of trouble, a lot of pain, a lot of grief. But there they were, by my side, just willing me through. You know, up to that point, no one had told me what had happened. They were very worried if I learned the details. I give up. I quit fighting. One day, I started asking questions, and still no voice it was my mom that would read my lips to answer. Like only a mom could. She was pro at reading my lips. The first question I asked simply. Why can't I move? Why can't I move? I had no clue. And there was a mother about to break the bad news. The news that broke her heart. She learned it. Break it ten times over to her firstborn, her only son, the act of God. We didn't figure it out. That was uh, my skateboard video playing there as it was coming in here. Act of God. Towards Kevin, he saw it. Paralyzed. Paralyzed. I understand there's a guy in a wheelchair sitting in front of you. So the guy in a wheelchair says, I'm paralyzed. You know, I, I, I probably lose shock factor. I'm like, holy crap, I didn't see that coming, right? But most of my life, I gotta say, I mean, there's no wheelchair. And I'm looking up in the audience up here, all the students here, definitely. I mean, when I'm your age, there's no chair. And I'm trying to paint a picture because we live different hour, you know. I'm young, I'm healthy, I'm active, I'm living life. I got a future ahead, I got family, friends, things I want to do. And all of a sudden, just wake up. My mom's pretty much telling me I'll never walk again, I'll never run again, I'll never jump again, I'll never skateboard again, snowboard again, play hockey again, I'll never stage out of a concert again, cliff jump again, run out of beach on a frisbee football, skateboard, never wakeboard. The list goes on and on and on. Just so sure the list of things that you all love to do goes on and on and on. My world is shattered. No. Most of cat, that's why you can't move your legs. I try to move them, they don't go. I try again, again, they won't go. I'm freaking out, panicking, because they won't move. I'm a little simple for me, I can just wiggle my toes. Because that's easier, right? I mean, wiggling your toes is simple. I mean, I guess you didn't mean to do it. You're not sure why you did it. You may just wiggle your toes when I said that. Anyone? Yeah, we're doing it right now. I wanted you to. Awesome if you are. And you know, I'm glad you can. I hope you can always wiggle those toes and do those things you care about. And that's the point. I couldn't do it, I still can't. I started to get scared. Those are the kick flip toes, 360 flip toes, switch hard flip toes. Anyone following? Any skateboarders in here? Woo! Thank you very much. It's my body for a lot of things. It's not working. But I couldn't yell, I couldn't scream, I had no voice. Couldn't stand up, storm in the hospital, and can't move. And beside me, my mom, she's crying. She's so hurt. I don't want her to hurt. So I'm trying to keep talking, trying to keep it inside. But inside, I'm just devastated. Eventually, I asked how it happened. And I can't even tell I was shocked when I heard a car crash. The way that I drove, the risks that I took. This wasn't my first car crash. I couldn't picture where it happened, though. It's the road I drove every day. I was even five minutes from home. Even my mom told me I was 
was drinking, I was speeding up. Sadly, these are things I was always doing. I got away with many times before. It just didn't make sense at first. But it didn't take long for it to start to sink in. And it's definitely crystal clear now. I look back on many choices in my life. Starting with that first joint I smoked, and on to harder drugs, and alcohol, and a lot of the poor choices going along with using those substances, with being getting them or being on them, a lot of the risks you know, we were taking. And you know, I'm, I'm, I'm the guy that goes out and a bunch of jumps in this wheelchair. You know, I love living life to the extreme, but there's a line. And there's a line we shouldn't be crossing. And I was all too often crossing that line. And so were my friends. Going out, partying, just making these stupid choices, taking risks, putting our lives out around us for risk. And you know, we had crashes, we had slams, we had bails. We had trips to the hospital for, you know, drinking too much. But we always seem to get home. We're more peace. At the end of the day, I walk away. And I think what happened is we started thinking it was, it was like a skill. You know, we're invincible. Nothing can take us down. But I know now it wasn't a skill, really. It was just luck. And I learned the hard way that luck doesn't necessarily last forever. Especially when you push it. I kept pushing my luck, pushing my luck. And one night, the luck ran out. And at that point, there's no turn back. I'm paralyzed. There's no cure for that. If there was, on this beautiful sunny day, I could be here in town. If the four wheels beneath me would not be a wheelchair, they'd be a skateboard. If there's any number of things I could be out doing, I used to do, it would be running down that beach, up on a mountain, hiking a glacier with my snowboard, you name it, that I'm not doing, because I sit in this chair. And I still sit in this chair, because the stupid, reckless choice I used to make years ago. And you know, it's years later, but it hits me harder and harder. You know, I know where to draw the line now. I don't have to make those stupid choices, take those risks. But I still sit in this chair. And all of us, right, we make choices every day, every night, every weekend. Here we are on a Friday night, a weekend ahead, or a big game tonight. Choices can be making. But after we actually stop and think, the consequence of this choice, of this next action, could last forever, a lifetime.